Hello and welcome to this edition of the UK Scriptwriters Podcast. You're hearing a different voice to those of Tim Plague and Danny Stack today. My name is John Caston and I'm the lucky bunny who's been deputised by Tim and Danny to talk with John Lloyd, CBE, yep. Reverence, uh, winner of almost as many BAFTAs as Dame Judi Dench. Are you going to win another one? I don't know. <laughs> um, plus a Grammy and an Emmy, and that is no mean, mean feat. Um, you're called a legendary producer who started on radio in the 70s with news quiz through such shows as To the Manor Born, co-writing the first series of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, then on to television with Not the Nine O'Clock News, Spitting Image, Black Adder, and now your current cultural home is with QI, which you invented and which you also produce. Listeners, you may also be very familiar with John's voice because he is the presenter of Radio 4's The Museum of Curiosities. And... On top of that, he has an armload of books he's published in his own name. So welcome, John. Thank you, Jan. Um, I think I ought to start by explaining why I'm the lucky bunny. Yeah. Um, because you and I met last month um, when you were doing um, an art centre uh, presentation called The Venerable Beeb, an audience with John Lloyd, which I think perhaps you've done a few times before. I've done bits of it, yes, yeah, not all of it, yeah. Do you sort of enjoy sort of dipping in and out and sort of making it current for wherever you're speaking? Uh, yes, I do. I like public speaking. I don't like the writing, though. That's painful. I mean, writing is difficult. My son's a songwriter, and he writes songs in ten minutes. That's the way musicians work. If you can do it at all, the song arrives from the sky, and it comes out in ten minutes. Writing's always difficult. I'm still finding it difficult. You know, I've been doing it for 40 years. So you're not a stream of consciousness, man? No. I think it's all about... Douglas Adams, my great friend, used to say, any fool can write, but any writer can cut. And the, the, the real trick of writing is actually about rewriting. It's not, oh, look, I've got words on the page. It's being able to self-edit, to, to look at your own work as if uh, an independent observer is looking at it. And that is the real trick about writing. And is that a skill that you think you had to learn in the early yeah. stages? So did it take you a long time to learn not to be precious about your work? Yeah, they often say, you know, cut out every single adverb out of your writing, that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, QI has taught me an awful lot about writing. It teaches you, because QI, people think, who don't know QI well, uh, and people who uh, perhaps have never seen it, is to think it must be about very clever people, it must be about using very long words and being very intellectual. But QI is not about that, it's about stripping things down until they're simple and clear and the whole idea is if you can't explain a subject to an intelligent 12 year old then you need to go back to university and do it all over again. Your demographics for QI I found quite interesting because um, there are statistics out there that say that it appeals to a lot of younger people rather than older people. Definitely, the, the, the older people are our weakest um, demographic. In fact, a very strong from you know eleven to you know early teens and and very strong with students. Um, but it's very broad, you know, people of all ages. It's a fascinating thing that everybody's born curious. Every child asks why all the time. But somehow over time, most of us um, divide into two. You know, the people who think they know everything at the top end, and at the bottom, the people who who know they don't know anything and don't care. And in the middle are these people who remain independently curious to the end of their life. My mum's like that. She's about to be 98. And her obsession at the moment is saints, the history of saints. And she's, you know, just fascinated by and history of art, that kind of stuff. She was curious when she was young, and now she's 97 and three quarters. And I suspect nine that's something that you've inherited Definitely, from Definitely, yeah. I, I, of course, you know, your early education is very important, and... I didn't really go to properly go to school on a permanent basis till I was nine and a half, nearly ten, um, because my dad was in the Navy, so he was always being posted abroad, and we were on troop ships in those days, you know, occasionally on, on ancient aeroplanes and driving long distances in station wagons, and um, and then we'd get to where we were going, and then you'd find it'd be three or four months trying to get into a school, 
and then you'd go to school and then you'd have to leave, you know, half, you know, half the So who actually of. taught you in those my earliest? Mom, my mum, there were three of us. I've got a younger brother and sister. And she used to teach us by doing quizzes in the car on the ship, you know, name three trees beginning with E, I always remember. Um, can you still do that? No, I can only do two. <laughs> <laughs> Elm and Elder. I'm sure there is another one. Uh, 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 Elderflower? That's that the elder? That's elder, yeah. Uh, yeah, did, we wouldn't do any good on QI, would we? No, but I mean, um, it's what QI thinks is that education should be fun. Why not? Everybody likes learning new things. But nobody likes learning boring new things. You know, why not teach people the interesting stuff? So, the, but the point is that the writing style that we aim to have here with the eight or so researchers is to teach people not to try to be clever, try to be clear, you know. Yes, do you, is one of the big worries that as you're trying to present facts that you might get something wrong? Well, no, we've, we, well, we don't worry about that because we're, the whole process of doing QI research is that you are meant to use multiple sources. So it's a natural cross-checking mechanism because, you know, if you're finding out something about tigers, you go to seven or eight different sources about tigers. It's not particularly about the cross-checking, but the interesting information is not all in one place. And one of the uh, ways that QI was initiated was I read in an encyclopedia long before QI was a, a thing that koalas never drink because they get all their... Uh, um, water from the eucalyptus leaves. You think, oh, how fascinating. I've never heard that before. And a year later, I found another thing in a different book which says that koalas eat so much eucalyptus that close up they smell like giant cough sweets. <laughs> but why, why aren't both those Do you facts think they have in the blue same place? Well. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> but why aren't those two things in the same place? And that was one of the, the things that inspired the idea. Because the way encyclopedias work is they have what we call a missing middle. So they've got, you know, basketball, a game played with balls and baskets. And then at the other end, the dimensions of the court, the exact weight of the ball and so on, that nobody but except a basketball court designer could want to know. And in the middle is the stuff they leave out because you can't put in everything about every subject. So the process of QI, of re QI research, is take articles, books, you know, vast encyclopedias of information and strip it down until you find something interesting. And so it is like a, like a writer's self-editing process. You either ignore the boring, jargon-ridden stuff or you strip it down until it's simple, until you yourself understand it. And so when you actually come to film QI, um, presumably there's a working script, which is obviously all the facts that whichever host is hosting Stephen Fry or Sandy Toxvig, will be sort of throwing out there with the graphics behind and whatever. Well, there's no script, really, apart from the hello, today we have blah, 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 and a joke, and the bit at the end. And then it is literally, you know, um, Alan, why don't pigeons like going to the movies? And then, and then there's the answer, which isn't really scripted, the, the, no, the notes. So you're relying on the talents of the guests. Yes, the, it's the least scripted panel show on television or radio by miles. So nobody is tipped off, you know, n nobody, there are no scripted answers, there are no joke writers on the strength. It's all discussion, really. And obviously Sandy or Stephen in the, in, back in the day have extensive notes so, to which they can refer to get the dates and times and weights and so on right. But there's no formal, written-down script, really. Wow. So how does Ian Lorimer, your director, know how to direct? Well, it's sort of similar to uh, shooting, say, a chat show, where the, uh, it's Ian and um, the vision mixer is a great vision mixer who's trying to intuit not who's speaking at the moment, but who's going to speak next. So a great vision mixer with a great director next door will be cutting to the person just before they speak rather than after they've started. It's a You're real skill. It's a really yeah. intuitive skill. Oh, absolutely. Well, all the, all the technical people that make the presenters and the performers look brilliant are the, the real technicians. They're the yeah. real skill and the real talent. I wanted to talk to you about talent today because obviously you've been a producer for a very long time. When I looked at it, do I say this? Because over 40 years, is a, it's a hell of a big number. Yeah. But it also means that you have seen so much because you've worked pretty much consistently 
in radio, TV, and also advertisements yes. during that time. So you've got a pretty unique view on finding talent and developing talent. Is that something that you've always enjoyed doing? Yeah, because the way I was... I wanted to be a writer, uh, and I was a writer-performer, actually, on the radio before I was a producer. <coughs> Excuse me. Um... Uh, six, what was it, how many, five of us from Footlights had a radio show. It was us, <coughs> actually, in Cambridge. <coughs> so, right, no. John, John <coughs> and I are sitting in the QI offices, yes. uh, so if you uh, hear uh, bangs and bumps, there's a lot of work yes. going on cut here today. Out, yeah, cut we'll, out, cut we'll cut it out, we'll cut it out. Yeah, I was a very bad lawyer at Cambridge. I realised I'd made a horrible mistake opting to be a lawyer, and so I had lots of other fun things like journalism and acting and so on. I discovered that jokes was the thing I wanted to do, so I was in my last year in Footlights, there were eight people in the in the summer review, and five of them got offered a radio show by BBC Radio, and I was one of those, and we were all writer performers in those days. So I started out doing that, and then I was headhunted to be a producer, which I didn't want to do. I didn't know what producers did. They seemed to just get in the way, rather. But somebody Do had... they still? Well, I try not to. Stephen Fry always says to me, the thing about you, Lloyd, is a producer, at least you don't make things worse. Well, that's about the best that can ever be said about you, isn't it, as a producer? I try to keep that in mind all the time. But somebody had faith in me at 22 that you can take the responsibility of being a producer and a trainee scriptwriter, as it were. Um, And that's I've tried to carry that on through the rest of my life. So nothing pleases me more than finding somebody who's young and talented, like all our QI researchers, encouraging them helping them if they get stuck, but basically leaving them alone to learn on the job, which is what happened to me. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's fright or flight, isn't it? It's, it's, yeah. actually, it's actually thinking, I have got this deadline, I have got to get out at this time, I've got to do this job. And it, it actually brings something out of you, doesn't it? Well, I think that my experience of hiring people is, uh, you know, always hire somebody better than you if you possibly can find them and then just encourage them to be as good as they can be. And you'd be amazed how, if you trust people, they get better every day. Yeah. If you sit on them all the time and tell them, oh, no, that's <laughs> you worry about what they're doing, you stand over their shoulder, they won't improve. Because they'll... they'll uh, and that, that's a big change from when I started. Um, one of the joys of starting in radio as a writer, producer, directory sort of person is that because radio is very light on its feet, you know, I used to make at least three radio programmes every week, you get lots of experience. So that's like 90 minutes every week? Yeah, yeah, at least that. Gosh, that's good. So I made 500 programmes in five years. And so... And you hear this, for everybody of your generation that's come, you hear the same story time and time again. I made so many programmes and that's where I cut my teeth. Well, you've got a situation now, somebody told me last week that the average time from in television to get from an idea to getting a programme on air is six years. Well, it's about the same as film, isn't mm. it? Uh, I mean, we well, that's, know, that's we know film and we know that it takes that long. It's the money mm. in mo- most cases. And it's the business side of it, which obviously is what the producer is doing when everybody is si- else is sitting waiting for the, the word go. Well, Jan, this is why so many people, particularly younger people, are turning to this kind of uh, broadcasting, as it were, podcasting. Yeah. because it is free of intervention and it does reach an audience, and maybe a small one initially, and actually that's the real editor you're looking for, not somebody in-house or a, you know, a boss or a controller or a commissioner. And comedy teaches this, of course, that when you, when you first start doing stand-up or sketch shows in front of an audience, you certainly learn very quickly. You, know, you may think this is very funny. If you've done it six times and it still doesn't get a laugh, you think, okay, I'm wrong about that. Yes. You get very, and this is because I come from a stage background, as so many of my generation do, Stephen Fry, Rowan Atkinson, all those people, Richard Curtis, we're all essentially stage comics to start with. And you get very, uh, you get a very intuitive sense of, is this funny? And you, as it were, the internal meter in your head imagines yourself going out in front of the curtain and delivering the line, and you know that's not going to work. Mm. I'll do something different. Uh, there is no substitute for experience, both in terms of performing and, of course, writing. The thing about writing is the more you do it, the better you get. And that's the problem is it's one thing sitting at home writing scripts and sending to people and having them rejections or perhaps not getting a reply. 
and quite another of continue, the continual experience of feedback. And what I would say to anybody who's starting out is get writing, get it out there, you know, do a blog. Um, my brother does a brilliant science blog from Ireland. It's wonderfully written, and, and he's got better every year he's done it, you know. You know, people write to you, they say, I didn't understand that, you explain it better, and, uh, and so forth. And, and, of course, with the technology now, everybody can make film. Yes. You know, you've got a well, phone. Uh, but six and seven-year-olds are doing it yeah. as part of their media studies at school nowadays. Yeah. So, you know, you only need a, a, any of the modern-day phones, and you can make a small film. Yeah. It's, it, it's practice, but where do you think it's going to go? In the future, can you see a future coming that perhaps is going to be different than we understand at the present moment? The future is always going to be completely different to what you expect. That's one of the rules, you know. As somebody said, it's very difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. Yes. So, um, but I'm a great believer in in the market. I believe that people, you know, will will gravitate towards something of quality. Um, you know, but how do people get to know about this? Because there's so much marketing goes on nowadays that um, a lot of the shows that become very, very popular become popular through word of mouth. Um, so do you think that's social media or do you think that's marketing in the sense that we know it, branding? I think social media in many ways is is overrated in, in terms of its marketing potential because people say, oh, we'll do this, it'll go viral. Things go viral because they're extraordinary. They don't go viral because a marketing company says they're going to go viral. Um, and for every you know YouTube entrepreneur who earns six million dollars a year, there's you know five million of them who who are watched by eight people. You know I think the average Twitter following is twenty six people. Yes, um, the and Facebook. There's the there's there's this rumor going around at the moment that they have this new algorithm, which apparently is nothing more than a rhythm. Mm. So all you ever get on your feed is the is what you want, you, what what they think you want, yeah. not what you actually want. So it, it's actually a bit of a it's a bit of a fallacy to think that you're ever going to get your work out there that way. Then okay, well let's talk about so QI is related to you know, human potential and writing ability and so on, because what QI says is that everybody's born a genius, unless you're born brain damaged, everyone's born a genius. And even some of the people with brain damage, there's considerable evidence now that people have a nasty knock on the head can suddenly learn to do amazing drawings or speak languages and so forth. Locked up in every single human being's head is this amazing possibility. And you only need to step out of, the, you know, take a step out of your house, as it were, to, f to find that. It's very difficult. For some reason, the universe has got something against creativity. It is not easy to write a great novel, or, as you know, to produce a fantastic film that lasts forever. It's very, very hard. There are so many things that come into play. You're mm. not a one-man band. You're no. never a one-man band. And, and that's a good thing. I believe in teams. But, you know, John Cleese used to say the only reason he was so successful as a comedy writer was he was one of the few people who knew how difficult it was. You know, and that's what happens when you first start writing. You think, well, look, especially with a computer, it looks like a printed page, doesn't it? It looks yes. like a professional book. And you think, in my day, when it was all either typed by hand or handwritten, you could see it didn't look professional. And so it was easier to see where the mistakes were, really. And there's quite a lot of writers today who still write by hand for that reason. Because it, it gets rid of that sort of professional gloss that makes you think it looks like a thing. Um, because well, it's, it's, it, and again, just to go back to QI, it's very like QI research. QI research is about close attention to detail. Mm. Um, for example, could you use the word find instead of discover? Why not use the shorter, simpler word that a younger person can understand? And at QI, there's a sort of what we call a styleless style of writing. It's now 15 years ago, I could tell within three sentences, which researcher had written which script. Because I'm get i the final polish guy, right? So they all write them, and now the the day-to-day -day producer will send me, or the script editor will send me six scripts to be ready by next week. And I, he doesn't put the names on, so I don't judge them. And genuinely, I can't tell who's written which now. And in a way, 
this is what great writing is. It's so simple, it looks like it hasn't been written. When mm-hmm. you read a great book, you don't struggle with it. You just whip through it. You can't put it down. They say, keep turning the page. And somebody once said the great aphorists, you know, the great writers of quotations, often sound as if they all knew each other very well. That a guy from, a German from the 17th century and W.H. Auden from the early 20th century and Plato, when it's translated into plain English, it's the same guy. It's almost as if we're channeling truth. So are you saying there's a universal style? Yeah, well, well, I'm not saying that, but it, it's what we like is a styleless style, is the QI style, is it's, there's no style. So it's a comfortable style. It's one that, you, it's it's, plain. It's, it's, it's one example, that you are ready to follow along with because you know where it's going. Well, for example, on our many books, we've done 17 books now, and they're very easy to read. You know, delight to read, usually. And um, the first thing is that the job of the writer is to not make it difficult for the reader. I don't really buy into sort of James Joyce, and I've never managed to read Finnegan's Wake, for example. I don't see why it should be an effort. I I dare say he is a genius, but it seems pointless having a genius who doesn't reach everybody. That's what I think genius is. When you hear Einstein talking, and you look at Einstein's... Um, formulae, E equals MC squared. It's so simple. And I believe the universe is built on very simple formulae and similarly writing. Look, it's only 26 letters just juggled in different orders. In the English language? Yes, in English. Yeah. If, you, if you go into another language... Actually, th- can I just interject this? This is an odd one, but it's something I suddenly thought about. You are known to have been almost at the centre of so many iconic... British comedy shows over those that you, uh, your long career. Do you think you could have ever worked in America or in any of the other emerging markets? Yeah, I loved. I love. I've worked in America. Oh, have you? Yeah. yeah. Sh- I shot now, the... this is where my research didn't. No, throw. no. Why should you know? But I mean, when I was younger, I really wanted to do that. I wanted to go to Hollywood and been. You know, I very nearly. One of the ads I did was with Leslie Nielsen. It was a very successful series, and I nearly shot Naked Gun, 90, uh, Naked Gun 33 and a third. It's flown first class to Hollywood and all that kind of stuff. I've, I've nearly shot movies several times, and I worked extensively in uh, New York and L.A., and I love working with Americans. I love American actors. American actors are journeymen. They just love a director who knows what he wants. They're very willing. They, they love a director who talks to them. And they're really well trained and professional. It's the most fun, and um, so I got on very well with the, those guys. And you know, America's an amazing place. And what about the humour? Do you think the humour translates? Because so many of the popular British shows have been taken over there, and they've had to be rewritten for an American audience. Well, yeah, but you can't when you're sitting here in London, and you think, well, why haven't the Americans? Why don't the Americans like QI, for example? I guarantee you go and sit in Corpus Christi, Texas, or Louisville, Kentucky, and then you think of Q. I think, well, no wonder. It, 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 the language is all wrong, the slang's wrong, it's too fast. They're talking about things that I've never heard of. But I guarantee, uh, sorry, that's just said that. If I were to go to New York for three months and make a QI with American performers, everybody would like it. It's a different, it's, it's not... But you're basically saying you're a British man um, working with what you know at the present moment and obviously making a very good career of it, but you would be willing to adapt to sort of learn a new way of things even now. Of course, just as when I'm in Greece, I speak a bit of Greek, you know. I don't say, where are my fish and chips? Of course, I have, you know, the souvlaki and the... Uh, the tzatziki and the goat and, pie. Yeah, um, and and I I'm because of that navy background I mentioned earlier. You know, my dad was in the navy. I feel happier abroad in many ways than I do here. So, when you're in California, do as the Californians do. And of course, it's it's not the humour doesn't translate, but the nuance of it. You know, the speed of delivery and the specific vocabulary and so on. But you think of John Oliver, for example, brick to his core, huge in America as a late night chat show. Do you yes. know his work? Yeah. And um, I have no difficulty. The, the, the ads I did with Leslie Nelson all based on Naked Gun. I wrote jokes for Leslie for those ads. And he goes, oh, I wish the Jan, I wish the 
jokes are this good in the movies, you know. Mm. It's when you... There's an absolute affinity between... You know, I know that they always say we're divided by a common language, the, the, you know, the, the Yanks and us, but actually I think there's also a huge degree of commonality. And it, it's, it's about Brits who've never been to America and Americans who've never been to Britain barely can understand each other, but those people who go across the Atlantic a lot, absolutely, you know, we're, bro- we're brothers. We, we, do, we do meet in the middle of the Atlantic, yeah, we don't do. we? Do, there's no doubt about it, we are the great... And, and actually, the, 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 the chemistry between a Brit and an American who do meet in the middle is amazing. Yes. You, you know, yeah, like absolutely. any partnership, yeah. you take the best of both and you make it into a third thing. And we actually like to like each other yeah, as well. Yeah, sure. So if we like to like each other, we're going to like to work with each other, aren't we? Yeah. Um, talking about working, um, as I was researching, you are very philosophical, you're incredibly well read. One of your most stock phrases, I've seen it in <laughs> every article, was... This would never have happened if... So obviously you're a great believer in the fatalistic fault. Something going wrong that you get something very right out of it. Um, Yeah, I call it disaster as a gift. I mean, it's not that... Well, how shall I explain this? I mean, if you're allowed to say this on podcasts, but, I mean, shit happens. You know? uh, well, yes, you're allowed to say anything you want to. We do understand that it. You cannot be a human being and not at some point in your life have tragedy. Yes. And at that, that point, the road forks. You have a choice. You can either go, OK, um, this is a disaster. I, I'm now going to sit in my room for the rest of my life and mope about it, or I'm going to shoot myself or whatever. Or you can say, all right, let's move on, let's find a way around this, what can I learn from this? And that is the whole thing, I think the whole game, the only game in town in fact is can you overcome the bad things that happen to you? And the counterpart of that is don't get smug about the good things that happen to you. Keep a, you know, a through line, which is whatever happens, try to remain slightly wry and cheerful about it. When it goes wrong you go, well, when it goes well you go, hmm, that's about it. And because everything bad comes from the opposite of those things. People who have success and think they're amazing and they're a genius, that, that's very destructive. And also people who, when things go wrong, think, why has it happened to me? It's only me, why is it? They don't think it's much worse things happen to all sorts of people. And that's basically how you handle your career in this business, isn't it? And you your ha- life. And, and, and your, exactly. And your family life and your relationships and your, your friendships, your children, all that kind of thing that... It's the only, it's, it's not that events happen, it's what you do about events. It's a stoic philosophy thing, you know, it's a very ancient idea, is the only thing that you actually have in your power in the end is your attitude to things. Everything else, your health, you know, what happens to you, you know, earthquakes, you can't control those. No, absolutely not. But you not. can decide to have a better attitude to the things that happen to you. I particularly like this this couple of sentences you said when you were on Desert Island Discs. I liked your music on Desert Island oh, Discs. Okay. Yeah, very much of an era, but it, well, I did like it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you said, I like starting things. There are starters and finishers in life. That's the great divide. I like the fight and the passion and the difficulty. Well, I don't like it, but it's what I do. Well... I'm amazed I said that so concisely, but I'd absolutely agree with that. I'm not I'm not a good finisher, actually. In the detail, you know, I'm good finishing, tidying up books and things, but I never really know when to quit. And I'm very bad about two things, being the market leader. I'm very uncomfortable at the point when the series becomes adulated and very successful. I don't know what to do with that. I'd much rather be the person struggling on the way out with people saying, you know, I don't really get this. Do you, oh, see, you, will, do you, you will, you will, you will get it. Do you see the next great start looming at that point? Um, and I just try. I've always tried to just, in that way, live in the moment. Is try and do what you're doing properly at the time, and then you know, as they say, you know, um, take no thought for the morrow. Yes, I know what you mean. I know ex- exactly how you, what you mean. It's, um, it is, it's. Part of this team building thing, isn't it? It's you know you have to to make a film, to make a TV program, to make a radio program, whatever. It's a lot of people coming together with different skills, 
and and pushing and pulling and moulding it and, and making what becomes a successful thing. Definitely. It's groups of people who do the best work. I'm, I'm in no way any sort of auteur, and I'm embarrassed by the legendary status thing. It's like, my job is to spot good... That's what I'm very good at, is spotting who's good. It's nothing to do with me. I just... I, I hire people that I like and I respect and I think are, you know, funny or interesting or clever or... Uh, and then you put them together and groups of us can do much more than one person can alone. And it's a lot less lonely, of course. That's a tremendous skill, though, to be able to talent spot. Well, I don't think it is. I think it's... <laughs> do you not? Of course not, because I'm just doing what the person in the cinema does. You know, on a Saturday night, go, oh, she's pretty. Oh, well, he's rather good looking. I like her. That kind of stuff. And that's what... You know, what I've always felt that a producer does, it's nothing, I'm very untechnical, you know, I couldn't possibly wire up a, you know, a light or uh, I don't know, really know what depth of field is or anything like that. But what I, do do I. Know is, <laughs> what I do know is when I see a good joke, I think it's funny. When I see a beautiful picture, I think that's beautiful. And who doesn't? Six-year-olds know about that. Yes, that's true. And actually, it's very similar, again, going back to QI, what we ask of researchers is the diligence of a professor and the open-mindedness, the wide-eyedness of a six-year-old. Whoa, that's amazing. And there's another door just gone downstairs, yeah. <laughs> which may actually be an indication of where we are at the present moment. I ought really be, because you've been talking for now for nearly 45 minutes. That's nothing to me. Oh. <laughs> I can talk the hind legs of oh, any kind of donkey. Well... You are very... Um, when I was listening to you a month ago, I actually did think, this chap is very genial and very... Um, there's the, the joke, the modest joke. You can't, you can't be modest all the time, nobody can, but some people are more gentle about things and they carry their, they carry their skill a lot more gracefully than other people. And you're certainly one of those graceful people. But what I actually did, what, how I'd like to finish this, because we will have to finish it, I'm afraid. It's been the revelation I expected it to be. I knew that I would probably prepare a load of questions and you would go off in different directions, which is wonderful. Thank Sorry. you very much. No, 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 no. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. But uh, you've actually reinforced something that I thought that first time I s sat and watched you do one of these audiences... I felt that you were a man who, had you lived at the beginning of the early 19th century, you would have been one of the romantic generation. Oh, you mean Wordsworth or something? Uh, yeah, and, and the scientists and the discoverers mm. and whatever, because you it's have a that... a period, 1800s, yeah. You have that sort of mind, don't you? And I've, I've got a feeling you would have been a scientist or a discoverer, but I think actually you'd have probably invented the hot air balloon. <laughs> I think that's near to... The guy I really admire is Luke Howard. Um, do you know who he is? No. Okay, he flourished in that sort of period, around 1800, and he was the guy who invented cloud classification. Oh, yes, I do that know, chap. yes. And he was so famous in his lifetime. Yes. He used to give lectures at the Royal Institution in Albemarle Street in London, and he was the pop star of his day, a guy who classified clouds, believe it or not. People had thronged in their hundreds of thousands to see him and wave at his carriage, and that's why Albemarle Street is the first one-way street in London. Really? To get past the Royal Institution, they had to keep the carriages going round. Well, I'm very glad to hear mm. another QI fact come yeah, out yeah. of your mouth. Thank you. But what I'd like to finish with, it's actually, it kept niggling me. There was a quote that I knew I'd read somewhere, and it took me ages to find it. And it actually was from John Herschel, who was the Astronomer Royal. Mm. And he obviously was the uh, inventor or forerunner. Of, he developed telescopes so that you could look into the skies and whatever. His sister found the first comet. And he said in one of his papers, and I think this sums you up perfectly, to the natural philosopher, there is no natural object unimportant or trifling, a soap bubble, an apple, a pebble. He walks in the midst of wonders. And I think, John Lloyd, you're one of those men who walk in the midst of wonders. That's such a brilliant quote, Jan. I tell you, it reminds me of a great Mark Twain uh, quote, which is, I wonder how much a soap bubble would be worth if there were only one in the world. <laughs> Should we find out? <laughs> John Lloyd, it's been an absolute delight talking to you this afternoon. Thank you so much. <laughs>